you know, when you're writing music all the time, you think every song is great. I really mm. thought something was special about If You Love Her, but I didn't know. I was like, yeah, it's great. I love all the songs. This one feels special, but. Hey, how's it going, Forrest? How you doing? I'm great, man. I appreciate you doing this. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, my name's Adam, and this is about you. Uh, your journey in music, and we'll talk about the EP out on Friday, I believe, right? Yeah, man. I mean, what's it? Thursday at midnight? Or, Thursday, yeah. <laughs> Thursday at midnight, is it Friday? Yeah, or Thursday, I think, 9, if you're in the West Coast. That's it. That's cool, man. Well, I uh, again, I appreciate you doing this. Um, I always start out with, uh, you were born and raised, or born in uh, Montreal, is that what I saw? But you kind of moved <laughs> around quite a bit, right? Yeah. I was, I was curious to see how you're going to piece that all together, man. I okay. Like I struggle on, on the best of days. Um, I'm born in Montreal, but then I've lived in Jamaica. I've lived in Ontario. I've lived in Calgary, LA, Germany, and now Nashville. Oh, you're in Nashville. That's where I'm at. Okay. Well, we should have done this in person. Right. I know. I didn't realize that. I figured you had to be in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, you said I made the trek, I think, like a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. We, I'm from San Diego, and we moved here uh, February 21. Okay, yeah, my, my wife and I moved here last year, almost a year to the day. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, we have two two kids, and I'm like, get them in school here, get rocking. Yeah, it's that's... pretty great. It gets a little hot, but apart from that, it's been pretty Oh, great. I know. It's brutal today, actually. <laughs> I was outside earlier. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. So, um, well, I, I was reading that you, you started, what, guitar around 15, but... Prior to that, did you uh, grow up with uh, music outside of, you know, learning guitar at an early age? No, well, it's kind of weird. Like I had, it's it's always like when you look back on life, you you really can point out the moments. You're like, oh man, that really was a, that was a moment. I, I had no clue that music was there. So I feel like it's always been omnipresent for me, but I didn't realize that until much later on in life. 15 was like the first time I, I had a guitar, like I, I was homeless and my, my Nana took me in and she gave me a gift. She's like, you know, what do you want? And it's, it's a, there's a lot of sad stories leading up to this, but I, I didn't really know how to answer that question. And so the only memory I have of being asked what gift I want was when I was like a little boy. And I, I asked for this like Fisher Price guitar. My uncle came over and he's like, do you want this guitar or this guitar and a microphone? And I was like five or six, of course. I was like, I want the thing with two things, not the right. one. <laughs> naturally. So he, I remember getting it <clears throat> and uh, it fell apart in like three minutes. So oh, man. So here I am, fast forward, 15 year old, young man, like and then my Nana, you know, sweet, sweet as she is. She's like, I want to get you a gift. What, what can I get you? And the only thing I could think about was that memory. And I was like, the guitar, but not the two things this time, just the one one <laughs> just the one so she got that for me and it was weird man i i remember i think i spent twice as much time staring at it as i did playing it i was i was afraid of it i remember yeah. picking it up the first time and i hit the strings they were probably all out of tune i had no clue how to play it i didn't take any lessons or anything like that but i remember when i hit those strings i felt this crazy feeling inside of me of like something wants to come out and it scared me. I didn't know what to do with it. So I, I remember putting it down right away and it oh, wasn't wow. until I was 21 that I really started like picking it up again. Oh, is that right? So when you got the guitar, you never really uh, even attempted to learn it after that moment? A, a little bit. Like I learned like a couple chords here and there, but it, it, it really scared me. You know, I, I didn't understand at that time what was happening. I didn't understand what emotions were, leaking out of me but it's obvious now like now that i do this for a living and it's been my life for the last you know however many years mm -hmm. it's obvious now looking back that there was a, a connection there was something attached to that guitar and there was something that was trying to talk through me you know for a lack of better ways of explaining like in you know, that muse was like hey i got some stuff to say with you wow. and it tripped me out you know and before then like i was a poet like i always wrote poetry and still, like I do spoken word, uh, those are all online or people can find them everywhere. And those have traveled around the world. I mean, like the world of dance has used them, figure skaters in the Olympics have used them. Yeah, that's so cool. That's what I really started with. 
so attaching music to those words and thoughts came much later and it was a it was yeah again all in hindsight I'm like wow i can't believe that that was all happening and then this is all here now yeah well, at what age were you writing poetry and i know that you had quite a chaotic upbringing and i, I don't want you to have to dive no no it's there. it's it's open i'm i've been trying okay. to figure out how to talk about it more to be honest because it's Kids like me need people like me now who aren't that kid any longer. Mm -hmm. And 100%. You know, and <clears throat> I always think if if not for this, then what was it all for? Like, how do I, I, I'm very fortunate. I'm one of very few people that come out the other side of that. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to figure out how to say all those real things and connect with them because those are at the core of who I am, who I am. So to your, to your question though, poetry, I don't know when it fully started, but it, I, I think the first memory I have of poetry, I was in the sixth grade. Something had happened between me and my stepdad. And I, I don't remember what happened. I don't remember how bad it was, but it was, it was rough. It was tumultuous. And I, there was this like English class thing where you'd write a poem or you can write a short story and you submit it. And if mm -hmm. story or your short, short poem was good enough, it could get published in Montreal amongst all the schools. And so I didn't really think much of it, but I wrote this poem about my dad of like, hey, I'm sorry that I made you mad. And like, I just want you to love me. And like really sad stuff when you go and listen to it now or read it. And uh, I thought nothing of it. I, I handed it in. And the next thing you know, I was published amongst all the top poetry in all the schools, elementary schools in Montreal. Wow. And that was like a, a really impactful moment. Again, looking back of, oh, like it was the first time I felt affirmation. It was the first time. Right, like a validation for what you had done. Right? Yeah, because no one was paying attention to that. My, mm -hmm. my parents weren't in a place to pay attention to that. They weren't, you know, it wasn't a stable environment. There was no like, there was no encouragement to, to write or be creative. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to do that. that. That takes a different type of parenting than what I had. So to see that come out and and that that did something to me and that i think that little spark of affirmation and validation was this like n kind of north star of like oh maybe do that again because that's how you can finally communicate mm -hmm. so i i don't know how much i did in between that time but a lot i suppose like it, it was all there yeah you know, like, childhood for me is a weird thing of trying to piece the, the puzzle pieces together you know yeah, I know you grew up in, in addiction or with addiction around you and, and you moved around quite, I mean, to get to, to Jamaica and like, how old are you when you're moving around all these places? It's like my whole childhood. It's It's been the biggest struggle for me is to try and like do a timeline because nothing's ever been written linear. Like I, I always, oh, okay. for me, they're like just memories. And mm -hmm. it, I think if for more, most people, when you think back to your childhood, you don't really go, oh, grade one, I was in this neighborhood. At this <laughs> right, <year."> right. <laughs> you have to really think yeah. about it for sure. For me, like time as a kid is going slow. It's infinitely long. Uh -huh. So I spent a lot of time in the islands in Jamaica and bouncing around. So that was a, a lot of my formative years was picking up. You know, I, I went to an elementary school briefly in Jamaica. All my best friends were Jamaica. And still, like, cool. I, go, I go there every other year and, and all the people have known me my whole life. Wow. It's kind of the only saw like only place of of like peace I get where the noise stops. Um but then we also lived in Florida and bounced around there. We lived again, Ontario is a different province in Canada, like mm -hmm. like you guys have states. Sure. And I'm from Quebec and we you know we moved and bounced around between Ontario and Quebec. But it, it's tough because every place that we move to is attached to a sad story. Mm -hmm. They're not like, and it's, it's a, it's a strange thing. So yeah, there was a lot of moving around, a lot of bouncing around growing up between addiction with my family going through addiction, not me. And then, right. the yeah, I'm, a, I go, I'm in a 12 step program. So like, I, I read that and I like, I'm like, oh my, I'm so grateful that I found that because I have two kids and I can't even imagine like, you know, what you've had to go through your whole life or at least early childhood. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all relative, man. Like, as you get older, I think you start to look back and it's always why me, that's always a starting point. Mm -hmm. of like, why did this happen? What did I do to deserve that? And I think as you mature, you're like, oh, it 
had nothing to do with me. It's like, that's just the life that was happening. Right. And that's kind of flipped into why somebody else, you know, like, why should it be somebody else? What can I do with it? Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool that you're finding your way through a program to sort your stuff out because then it'll lead to you just being a, you know, infinitely it's, better. It's parent. definitely led to me being a better person over the years. I mean, but it, it did take a minute. I mean, I had to have kids and see that early on to be like, I need to like really, you know, get my shit together here. You know what I mean? Like the, your, your mindset has to really change, but, and I, and I've seen the worst and the, you know, the best results from it. So it's, I, I read your bio and I was, I had like so much empathy. I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, go it's two that. sides wow. of the same coin, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I know we're just meeting, but I'm stoked and proud of you for, for doing that. Cause it, uh, thank you. I wish, I wish that my parents could have done that. Mm -hmm. You for know, sure. even just saying that out loud, I, I, I get like this wave of emotion right away. I'm like, man, cause it, cause it hits you like, Oh, why didn't they, why didn't they sort that stuff out? Why didn't they figure it out? And that bleeds yeah, it's the disease. It's, you I know, not, was I not worth something? You know, it's, like I always tell people, and I've written about it a bunch in, in some spoken words that have never come out, but my stepdad, I think by the, by the time of his demise, and like he went through some stuff, man, like people shot him on our front doorstep, and oh it, it was intense. like, yeah, he was part of the mob, so it was crazy, like, and, but my brother was brilliant, my sister is stunning, she's beautiful, and has this big soul and she's larger than life and I'm a poet and wordsmith and like you know have gone from being this homeless kid to a guy with platinum plaques it's it's yeah. a very confusing line but the, the real tragedy of it all is that our parents never clued into that so while they were all seeking like the gold and riches of life you know like to be the king of that thing in their world they missed all the riches that were like in front of them right there. They had, yeah, no, hundred percent, you know, and now my brother is, I don't have a relationship with them, but, uh, you know, he's unfortunately, a, a, a heroin addict and bouncing on and off the streets and trying to find his way. And like, it's all, all I can hope for is that he does. And my sister is slugging it out in life, trying to, you know, raise two kids on her own and, and, and do life. And, and I'm out here just trying to make something of what was left of nothing. So, sure. you know, yeah, I mean, what I, how, how I had to come to grips with, at least myself was just, you know, you learn that it's, it is a disease and you have this kind of binary, uh, existence. It's like, I need this and my brain's telling me to get this constantly. Right. I mean, yeah. and you have to have a moment or a lot of people don't. Right. And you kind of have to have this like big, they call it the spiritual, you know, experience or whatever you just find like it, yeah. someday it clicks, but it doesn't always. Right. I mean, and that's the thing It's hard is, you know, you, if you have this disease and you're, it's the only disease that you don't want to get treatment. It, the only disease, like if you had cancer, they'd be like, you'd go and get the treatment and fix yeah. the cancer. But this is like, I don't know. It's just such a weird, uh, a thing. But uh, again, I always, I feel so, uh, like empathetic to you and, and, and anyone I read those stories about and, but it, you've turned out obviously amazing in what you're doing and in the way you've dealt with it all and the way you're able to express yourself through poems and songs and, and everything else. So that's Thanks, huge, man. man. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been a journey. It took a long time to figure out. Yeah. When you're missing those like cornerstones of life or stepping stones of life, you tend to do things like really ass backwards. Right. Everything's confusing and you're messing up at, like a, an expedited rate next to the next kid who might have like that kind of whole upbringing. And it's mm -hmm. not to say that like upbringing is everything. It's, it's part of it. Um, but you know, I'm sure you can attest like when you're trying to sort through your own stuff, like all the damages is ha all the damage is happening. It's, and it's, ha it's chaotic around you. It's chaotic for the right. people that love you. Mm -hmm. And like, I I've gone through my own versions of that, just being the byproduct of that household. Sure. So there's like all these things that I don't know how to work with. There's like mm -hmm. just like some normal stuff, normal cues I didn't figure out. Like, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I, again, I'm I, I keep coming back to it, but I'm stoked that you you found that in yourself because man, yeah, like you're gonna ha you're gonna get the chance to raise your kids and and be the best, at least give it the best shot that you can to do the best. <laughs> right. you can do it. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Like that honestly means a lot. Yeah, it's. You, yeah, you see the wreckage and you have to face it and go back and just say, 
you make your amends and, and do all that stuff. But it's like, you know, on the other side of it, like I can't even imagine like being on the end of what do I do? How do I help this? But yeah, there's really nothing at that point. To do. Dude, this is something I've been thinking about a lot as of late. Cause you know, I coming from the byproduct of gangs and violence and like, that was my whole upbringing up until I was 21. Like that's pretty much everything I knew was, was really intense. Um, the consequence of, of those types of places that you're in is the interactions you have with people. And the, the further consequence of those interactions is how they hold you in their mind for life. And I, I, it's something I've been like wrestling with in the last year or two of like, I've done so much work on myself as a human to, to do okay. in, in a, a basically an impossible path. And when I was younger, I was a lot rougher around the edges. And to think that I could have ever impacted someone negatively just because of the position I was in, not because of the intention, it's just because of the position, unfortunately, right. that the consequence of that is how they hold you in their mind. So there's someone 15 years ago who like thinks I'm the biggest piece of shit. And, and like, right. it, 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 like it you don't me. even know. <laughs> yeah. You don't even have no clue how hard I've worked to like try and be okay. And, Mm-hmm. It's something that I don't think a lot of people talk about because like, as you're saying, like the wreckage of, of going through what you're going through, whether you're an addict or whether you're just, your undiagnosed mental health stuff is going on or you're just lost, you know, nobody, nobody really kind of holds you up for like, okay, like once you get across that, we'll all be here to kind of cheer you on. No, it's like whoever is part of that wreckage sits in that wreckage of you and, and likely isn't going to come around to how good you've made yourself. And it's just a trip because you're like, shit man, I just wish that I could go back and like, you know, like, man, bam, here, I heal your wounds. And yeah, right. No, for a hundred percent. And, but it's finding those, you have to kind of go really look and try to find those people in those moments. And then, okay, you, do I reach out or is it going to be more harmful? It's like a whole thing. You know what I mean? There's so many variables to even, there's, there's probably a thousand people that I owe an amends to that I couldn't even think of off the top. You know what I mean? At the time when I was really digging into it, but, um, it's it's a trip. Yeah. But you can only just move forward and hope, you know, you know, that you, you know, mean well. And if you had the opportunity, you would mention it. But other than that, I mean, all you can do is do what you can do. That's why I make me. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, going back to kind of your story, I mean, you were in a, band right before you started this your project yeah and you I did mean, well I, right your band and you were like a more of a reggae band did that come from you know the living in jamaica and kind of falling into those roots i don't know yeah i think um i think for me trying to figure out again i wasn't like I'm, i've never been the musician's musician i've never been the guy who like yeah i, I grew up i had the lessons i crush it i'm, I'm a genius <laughs> no, if anything i'm like a blue collar guitar player and singer like i'm just trying to make make it yeah, i love like your that. voice man it's you have a really like the tone of your voice i love man. I think thanks really man cool. that's just that's that's parent problems coming out <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, thank you i appreciate that now, th- for me i i i started out i started out with rock music like heavy metal music like for me i, I was inspired in my youth like Deftones and Slipknots and Nirvana, but then also I, like the first music I ever bought for myself was Bone Thugs and Harmony because I was so connected to the song called Crossroads. Oh hell yeah! I was like, man, this this song is incredible. Um, so I realized, like looking back, you know, it's always been about the song or like listening to the Eagles and Desperado, like that really did something to me, and like I've always been ch- I've been chasing that song my whole life, and so. When it came time to making my own band, I think that part of going through the process of writing, it brought me back to my formative years and I didn't realize it, but for me also reggae is such a huge part of my upbringing. Like I grew up listening to people like Luciano and Capleton and Coco T and Bob Marley and the list goes on and on and on. And like Buju Banton and so for me, those sounds were really like etched into me. So it's something I had to work out and, and refine. And so the first time I ever made music, it, you know, for myself, for some of I wrote a song, I didn't even know I was writing a song. I was like, just going through a heartache and a, my first real breakup. And I was sitting there just 
I, I always freestyled. That was kind of my thing. That's how I write. I just pick up a guitar and I'll hum along and make up stuff and make up words. And people used to do it as a party trick with me. They'd be like, oh, I do this thing, make up a song. And I was <laughs> crazy enough to do it and not care what the outcome was. So people <laughs> liked it. So I was sitting there um, starting to play. And then all of a sudden, uh, my kid sister was like writing down the lyric. And she was like, do you realize what, like, what you're saying? And I didn't realize it. So I, I ended up looking at the paper and all of a sudden it's lyrics. I was like, damn. So I took that back to Calgary and that's where I started my career really. And I was like, all right, maybe there's something to this. So I started jamming to that thing. For the first time, there was a bit of structure to a song. It was the same lyric, the same melody, the same chords. And as people would hear me play it, they would start going, that's, that's pretty good, man. Like, maybe you should think about that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, whatever, you know, I don't care. And at the time I was like a bouncer in Calgary, knocking heads and like just trying to come out of being, you know, a, a young punk. <laughs> and they had karaoke every Tuesday night at this place. I'm sorry if you hear my dog barking. I'm not sure. Oh, that's all good. If you, that's I, the beauty it, of this. Yeah. Big bulldog just trying to bulldog. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, there's a place called the Rusty Cage and they did karaoke on Tuesdays or something like that. And the guy who ran it is named C Train. And I was like, well, I don't know where to play music, but people keep telling me I need to play this song. So I, I went to this karaoke bar with a guitar. I was like, hey, can I, can I play my song for you? <laughs> and they all looked at me like I'm some crazy raisin cake. And I'm, I'm like, all right. they're like, all right, get up and play. And I got up and I played that song. And it was the I closed my eyes. I was really, I was anxious. I was going through probably like a oh, panic attack inside. I bet. Wow. I to have the courage before. to do that, right? Yeah, it was nuts. It was really crazy to, to even try that out. And so I closed my eyes and I got through it. And when I opened my eyes, you know, maybe 15 people that were there were all kind of standing at attention looking at me. And then they started clapping. And that was the first time I'd ever felt that type of affirmation. And I was like, oh, this is, this is crazy, man. I, I have no clue what to do with this. It made me feel good. It made me feel like a human, you know? It made me feel like a person. It made me feel like I was good at something. Mm -hmm. that I wasn't just a punk who could fight well and like that, you know? So it was being validated for art is a very different feeling than for anything else. Mm -hmm. And so I got addicted immediately. I, I, I need this feeling. And so I, I was like, I got home and I'm like, how, where do you play music? How do you do this? And and I see, you know, I'm finding all the open mics and then people are giving me the encouragement there and, hey, you're really good. And, and I was like, I need more songs. I can't just have one song. So, <laughs> yeah, play the same one. so, But in the process of doing that, a couple of the songs, I didn't know about genres. I didn't know about music. I didn't know you can make a music a career. I knew about bands and stuff, but it never even dawned on me. It was so far out of reach from my sure. world that I was, I was, I, was I, can't, I can't do anything with that. But I was so addicted to this feeling that I started to just come up with anything. What could I write? And I was crazy because I would sit there and write something at two o'clock. And then by five o'clock, I was at the open mic playing that thing. Wow. I, I, I need to test this out. Do, what do people like? How, what do I like? Do, are people connecting with what I like? Do they like what I like? And so it became this thing of every day I'd write something, I'd go to an open mic. If they liked it, then I, I would keep that. And if they didn't like it, I wouldn't. I'd have screw it, I'm going, to, I'm going to try something different. And as that started to form, some of the songs that poked out were, were reggae. You know, my, one of my Nana's favorite songs had that, you know, like, you know, roots rock reggae beat to it. And so when I came time to making like a first real, real album, that's a lot of the direction that I went in to honor these places that, that I'd found. Mm -hmm. But one of the songs on my first album and my first band that stood out in kind of changed my life was not reggae at all it was just an honest singer songwriter song um give me a second i'm gonna walk with you just to let this guy out because he's being crazy oh yeah no go ahead man i don't this want to is, take up all your time but no no you take up as much time as you want <laughs> this, is, this is the the boss of the house so people, oh I, oh that's i love bulldogs that's so all he wants is to go outside and then in 15 minutes he's gonna yell at me to come back in <laughs> this is life uh, so yeah, so as I was trying to figure out what I'd be playing, that's what happened. And, and so this first song that kind of started to skyrocket for me, um, was a real song about my mom. It was, I wrote this apology that she never gave me and I wrote the answer that I could never give her back. Wow. 
and I needed it and I didn't realize how bad I needed it. And so I wrote that song out. It was called All You Need Is Love. And it talked about her taking pills when we were kids and it talked about, you know, all this, all the shit that happened that was crazy. And then again, the apology and like, and it was a trip because all of a sudden out of nowhere, that song is now at radio in Canada and I'm unsigned. I don't have anything going on. And then that leads me to get a deal in Germany. And then all of a sudden that song's all across the radio in Germany. And I'm, I, I go from zero to hero. It feels like overnight because I couldn't get any traction in Canada starting out, which happens to a lot of people. And then overnight, you know, I mean, 10 years overnight is what it feels like. But, <laughs> you know, next thing you know, I'm, I'm playing in Germany to big crowds. And then I get nominated for a Juno, Juno which is Canadian Grammy. Great. And, and then within a year, I, I quit and I disbanded. Wow. It was that fast, huh? For me. Yeah. Within a year or two. So yeah, it was rough. So like, I mean, just to be honest about it, like I found myself suicidal. I found myself, um, really going through some stuff mentally and not knowing what it was. And I wasn't around people that, that, that were conducive to a healthy life and, mm -hmm. I felt like I was losing my mind and I felt very alone. I felt very fragile. And I remember being in Germany and we were playing to maybe like, I don't know, five or so thousand people. And on stage while this was happening, um, I'd gained a lot of weight at that time. I'd gained about a hundred pounds and I was like really mentally not okay and very depressed and, and didn't know any of this. I didn't know about depression. I didn't know about anxiety. I didn't know about anything at that time. I just thought everybody felt the way that I felt. And, I was starting to isolate in a really bad way and also didn't realize that. So I couldn't be around public. I could get on stage. I could get in the van. I can go to, or a bus and go to the hotel, but I really struggled around people. You know, I, I, I was just, yeah, I was falling apart. And so here I'm on this stage playing to this crazy crowd and it was incredible. It was one of the best shows of my life. And the whole time, what people didn't know was that I'm on stage like, agreeing with my mind that when I get home, I'm going to take my life. Jeez. And so I was at that place. It was so dire. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was crazy because even that show that we had like a 13 minute encore, they wouldn't let me get off stage. It was crazy. It's like, again, I don't know what's out there, but yeah. something, something was happening in the fabric of whatever this is. Mm. And so I couldn't get off stage and that was it. And that, it was a really beautiful feeling. And then when I got off stage, I was so, it was this weird thing. Cause I, I'd agreed in my mind that I didn't want to live anymore, but it brought me this, the first freedom in my mind. And the, like, it brought me a sense of peace weirdly enough. And I remember walking through a festival ground after that around a whole bunch of people. And, and then I flew back home to Canada and this, a, a little plot twist thing is I met this guy not long before I went, and him and I were about the same weight and we agreed to, to lose weight together. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I went to Germany and probably put on another 15 pounds. <laughs> and when I got back to Calgary, he had lost probably about 10 pounds. Wow. And I felt so disappointed because here's this person for the first time in my life that's like joined with me to do something and they actually did it. Mm. And I felt so guilty that I said, okay, I'll put my plan in my head on hold and I'll start this journey. And then that led me to losing a hundred pounds and I quit oh my the band God. and I spent the next year and a half just trying to work on my mind and just getting got, healthy there. Yeah. Well, I got diagnosed yeah. with bipolar disorder and helped me understand what was going on. I was like, Oh man, sure. this makes a lot of sense. And, and then, in that became a whole new self discovery process. You know, I, I put up the hung up the boots or shoes or whatever you say, like the gloves for reggae music and, needed to kind of find my myself and my voice and what it was I wanted to say because the feelings I had were pretty deep and I never knew I'd come back to music but as it happens you know the first song I write in like a year and a half ends up landing on a desk at Atlantic Records and then here I am at this point in time living in this family's basement I've got no money and my my buddy that played keys for me in Germany flies over to Canada and we get this message being like, can you be in New York in 24 hours? Oh my gosh. Like, whoa. I wasn't prepared for this. I, I just wrote one song. So I had no music. It, had was that If You Love Her? What, what song was it that you wrote? That was that a they... song called Love Me. Oh, Love Me. Okay. That was Love, love Me. me. 
so I end up getting on this plane and I, I've never dealt with any of the big American record labels. I'd only dealt with like Germany. Yeah. The German, so like this, these are the big guys, you know, and the big, yeah. Guys. I mean, a la- there's like one of the five or six massive, labels. you know, biggest labels there in yeah. the world. And right. I said the big guys, but really you got Julie Greenwell. So the big girls, the big women, the big people, <laughs> like they're bad. <badass>. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's crazy. So I, I have this song and I'm with my buddy Christoph and we're flying to New York and, uh, I'm like trying to come up with other songs and finish songs and ideas in my head because I'm about to play for them. So I get to Atlantic and I walk in. It's they're, they're just moved into their new building. This is like eight years ago now. It feels like a century ago, music wise. And uh, it's a brand new studio they have. And I'm like the first person to play in it. So Christoph wow. and I were there. There's a whole bunch of chairs lined up. I think I'm playing for the whole office. And then the president of A&R, Pete Gambarg, walks in with his assistant and he sits down, just the two of them, and he goes, play. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I died. Talk about <laughs> pressure. Oh my God. Yeah. Was, and I, I didn't, wasn't terrible or any, by any means, but it's certainly, I think anybody would have been able to tell, hey, kid's got one good song, but the rest, like he's got to figure it out. And mm-hmm. so as fast as that happened, I was on a plane back to Calgary and nothing came of it really yeah so it was like this really weird feeling of like oh man what what was that and so you're on atlantic now correct yeah well this is yeah okay yeah i I didn't know if it was that moment it was like all right we love you it's off to the races (laughs) because you'd hope so but yeah it didn't happen like that and so myself and christoph we ended up jumping on um this tour of the west coast of, of the states um so this guy I know named Sat had this radio show and he called Passport Approved and they did this Passport Approved radio tour. And what station was it? I did? I was on the radio for like almost two he, decades. That's how I he's like began a, the podcast. He is. Um, I don't I don't fully understand. But he's got like a show that gets put out to all the stations. Oh, it's syndicated. Syndic- yeah, yeah, syndicated. Okay. So it's called Passport Approved. And so. Anyway, we, we play this West Coast tour and maybe it's like, I don't know, eight or nine gigs. But now these songs are coming to life and I've been able to refine them and, and put everything on. And so we end up getting to Los Angeles and now I've, you know, I've got a whole new set and all these songs are super, super fine. And I get asked to play this, this like luncheon thing and... Uh, it's it's like an award ceremony for George Ergatutis, who did a lot of stuff. He's British. He did like, I don't know where he's at right now, but I know he's been between BBC and Apple and Spotify. He's done a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, so it's like a, an award ceremony, like lifetime achievement stuff. And so I'm playing this thing, two songs, hottest day in Los Angeles it's ever been. We're at the Roosevelt Hotel. I'm wearing all black. My my vocal pedal fries. Christoph can't touch the black keys on his, on his keyboard. Oh, my God. It's that hot. And like Jimi Hendrix's daughter's there, like Neil Warnick from from CAA, like everyone's there. Yeah. I get up and I play my two songs. So I played Heaven's Telephone and Love Me. And I get off and I'm, you know, my white pasty Irish ass is like dying. <laughs> and I'm like, feel like I'm melting and I just need air conditioning. So everyone's like trying to come and talk to me and I'm like, I can't talk. I need to go like not die. Mm-hmm. And so I duck out to this other part and there was this guy named Seymour Stein sitting there. And so Seymour, uh, he's sadly passed, um, but he was one of very few like living music legends. Like he he built Sire Records. So he found, discovered and broke Pretenders, Smiths, Depeche Mode, Madonna, Tegan and Sarah, Gee. the Ramones. Um, that's all. I was going to say, I know the name, but I didn't, I, I didn't know, know the, his, the, yeah, his achievements, it's, but it's, damn. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> and so Seymour is there and I see him and I just kind of like stop in my tracks because he's exactly where I need to be to cool down. And he, he looks at me and he goes, Forrest. <laughs> I'm like, what? He knows my name. <laughs> he knows my name. And uh, he goes, uh, he goes, I, I want to tell you something. He goes, you write, you write really great songs. You write really great songs. And then he said the next thing to me, which is, he goes, uh, I'm going to send you some paperwork over the weekend. And all I ask is that, you consider my paperwork before anybody else's. Oh my it was god! Like such a such a G move and such a 
like what an interesting experience. And then we spent the next hour just talking about music, talking about Canadian artists who are known in the States and under different names and, you know, whatnot. And so wow. fast forward within a month, I get flown back to Atlantic and Seymour had grabbed Pete and spoken about me. So now I end up back in the same studio with all those chairs, Pete and his assistant walk in, Seymour and his assistant walk in and they go, play. <laughs> <laughs> You're like deja vu, <laughs> but two people on your side at this point. <laughs> yeah. So this time I played and, I, and the songs are much more refined and the performance, I'd finally gotten a little bit of that like rust off mm -hmm. so I could do my thing. And uh, yeah, they left the room. One of the best parts of that moment though, is Seymour looking at me in the middle of, of playing. I played Heaven's Telephone and he, he goes, can you just play that song again? Wow. So I played that song again. And anyway, they leave the room and, uh, I found out right after that that they'd offered me a record deal. And so it was the starting of a, a very long relationship with Atlantic. And I love Atlantic. I, I know a lot of people harp on their labels. I love Atlantic. I love the people I work with every day. It's crazy how cool they are. That's like, so it's amazing. The, it's been the Yeah, best. you either hear the story of, you know, oh, I'm going to sign and drop or whatever, or th this is the best thing that's ever happened. But they, yeah, at the well, end I mean, of the they, day, they're they a business, right? If you're not providing them what they need then why are they gonna yeah i mean look they for me they've given me the opportunity to change my life right that the rest is on me you know they know what to do when there's a hit song that's that's their world but what they don't know how to do is to motivate me the artist to go and write them they they can say here's a room here's a person they try to facilitate and connect the dots but ultimately you have to show up and and do it Mm -hmm. And I, I've been swinging at the that fucking hit ball <laughs> like my whole life, like trying to get there. It feels like, and even with that, like I got signed to Atlantic and things are great, and put out an album and started to get some notoriety. You know, Amazon calls me the number one or uh, top one hundred artist of twenty seventeen with Love Me, which was crazy. Yeah. I moved to Germany to be with my ex and and to be Christoph was there. Um. And then fast forward, I go through a breakup, my life falls apart, and now I'm caught catching a flight to LA and then I'm living in the back of a rental car. So I'm signed to Atlantic Records. I've had a song that was in the top 100 songs for Amazon Music of 2017. Things are happening. I just, and before that I toured at Need to Breathe and like played Red Rocks and was getting standing ovations at the opener, no one knew. And then all of a sudden I'm living in the back of a RAV4 in, in Los Angeles and then bouncing between a buddy's couch and my other buddies like hooking me up with the place to stay here and there and, and the back of a car and I'm emasculated and humiliated and, and embarrassed and I'm like I guess this is it I guess you gotta call it yeah I mean what a gut punch to your ego right I mean you get back and you're like I have these songs I, I've had all this validation and now I'm pretty much homeless at this point again yeah it sucked like I was yeah. sleeping by the PCH every night and, you know, the cars are whizzing by one side of you. And then you got this beautiful sound of the ocean and then <laughs> sure on the other. car behind you with some people coming and like smoking weed and yelling and the car in front <laughs> of you is a couple who are fighting and you're just like, this is the craziest experience. This is sure. such an LA falling apart cliche right now. Right. Right. I'm, I'm like cleaning myself up at the Vons off the PC. <laughs> like just trying to make sure I know the bathroom code every day. It was so embarrassing, man. You Did know? you have minutes out at that point or was this even before that? Yeah. Oh, okay. That was out. out. Yeah. And so that, again, all that was doing great. It was awesome. It was like, mm -hmm. it was good for me, but the world had just fallen apart. And so it was mm -hmm. just me by myself and went through the worst heartbreak of my life, you know, like yeah the world just fell apart right 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 in front of my eyes went from having everything living in this beautiful house in germany finally feeling like i had a family you know how you know it, life was life it was good had my mm -hmm. dog had my girl had a house had a place had a, everything was i felt very stable for the first time and it was hard for me to even process that a lot of time of that was like me fighting that feeling of being like i don't deserve this this is strange mm -hmm. And then for it to all fall apart was like, oh, I guess that's what happens. And then how do you then, you know, kind of persevere and then make it through that and then kind of get back on your on your feet? 
because you put an yeah. album or a record out in 2020 was that like the sideways yeah was that from i mean you said minutes was out so you and your car was probably around 2018 ish i mean and then you have this pandemic that happens i mean i don't know where like that was so many things that kind of happened even up to the point of of sideways coming out. yeah 2019 so i'd written all of sideways which is the weirdest thing because a lot of it now feels like a premonition like when i go back and i listen to those songs at that time my, my relationship was okay life was good but the songs that i was writing about were really like feeling like things were bad mm -hmm. so to to i'd written all these songs and then i came home to this catastrophe of a relationship falling apart and then i land in la and it's april of 2019 and it's chaos i mm -hmm. mean I'm like, okay, what what do I do? I'm in this car, life sucks, but I'm I wanted to pour every ounce of myself into myself and take take it on. You know, when things happen, kind of like I said earlier, instead of pointing the finger at other people, I I really go this way a lot, and I I go instead of going why me, I go why should it be anybody else? What can I do with this? Mm -hmm. How can I navigate these feelings? What what can I do? And so every single day while I was in that car or crashing on a friend's couch, I got up and I went and wrote. I kept writing. I, I, I called the record label. How I got the car was I had no money. I had 300 bucks in my pocket. I called Pete at, at Atlantic and I was like, hey, I didn't tell anyone I was homeless. I didn't tell anyone that the wheels had fallen off. I didn't want to create that like stress for anybody. I just said, hey, I'm in LA. I need a rental car. I'm going to go write. And so Pete was like, yeah, of course. Which is, which is already bizarre because normally that's not how it works. You don't just get a rental car. <laughs> yeah. So I had that rental car for almost a year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And it should have so, probably just bought you like a, <laughs> a Kia or something. Just... <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. So here I am close to around L.A. And I'm putting myself in nonstop rooms as I'm going through this heartbreak. You know, I came home to my, my ex having an affair and I had to find out on an iPad Holy shit. going through all this breakup and I just tried to help my brother in Canada and he was falling apart saying he was going to take his life and I'm like I know what that feels like let me try and bond with you but you know but that where his his disposition is tough and that was the last time I saw my brother too so there's a lot there's a lot of moving parts and so I fly back to Germany from Canada and then I again I find out my ex is having this affair and it's just nuts and but I'm like I love you I can see through that that's not a problem let's figure out what's going on mm -hmm. let's talk out these issues because I feel similar to you and so for the next I don't know six seven months of being in LA going through this breakup I'm trying to connect with my ex to work on it and see if the distance makes a heart heart fonder and every single day I'm, I'm writing as as it's as I'm going through it, I'm just telling the story. And fast forward, I end up going on a month long trip with my ex to Australia to see if we can rekindle. rekindle. And it was awful. Like I tell a lot, I tell my friends that if you're gonna go through a breakup, one, do it in Australia. Like if you're gonna, <laughs> you're really gonna burn the house down. Australia, That's the place to do it. <laughs> oh my god, dude! It was the most beautiful backdrop to the broken heart. I, like it was unbelievable because you have all these beautiful things, the juxtaposition between the, the scenery and the people and the kindness and the, and the depth of that place. And then this like death of your relationship at the same time is un it's unparalleled. Yeah. So I go through all this relationships over. I fly back to LA. I, I, I had spent, all the money on a credit card to get to Australia oh, and back. Man. I was toast. And I landed, I land in LA and now I'm like, oh, there's no going home. So this is it. I have to figure out what I'm doing. I have to figure out where to set up roots. It's hard being a Canadian in LA. It's gonna if that's gonna cost you 10 grand to get started anyway, like it's it's a lot. And so Yeah, with the visas and all that. Stuff yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah. So my buddy ends up like offering me his couch full time so I can crash there. And I'm like, thank you so much, my, my, my guy. And so now I'm crashing on the couch, relationships over. And I go and I hang out with my buddy, Steve Solomon. And we're at a place called, I think it was called Commissary in LA, Burbank. And we're having coffee and potatoes. And we're, we're both kind of like, we're kicking the shit, but we're just, we're taking the piss out of, 
out of hits. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, you know, like instead of trying to go and write a hit all the time, just go write what it what it is that you feel because that's that's really what what you need to do. Like, yeah, well, that's what worked for you in the beginning too, right? I mean, just writing, it. being authentic, and writing what you felt, and then it became the hit. That's it. And so everything's kind of in between. So we're joking around and Steve and I end up going back to his apartment where he had a studio and I'm like, let's get inspired, man. And he's like, fuck off. I don't want to get inspired. Like, <laughs> oh. it's like, dude, we just had a bunch of potatoes. I just want to kind of chill and like, you know, <laughs> Lay just down. whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 for real though. And I picked up the guitar and the first thing that poured out was if you love her. And it, oh my gosh. It was there. Like I have the voice notes of it. It's in the first five minutes all of all of what you hear is pretty much there the bones of it at least mm -hmm. and so as as it happens like i'm in the room with steve and steve's amazing he's like steve's one of my best pals and he's a hero like he sat with me through the darkest emotions i had through that point in my life and helped me etch out every single moment of it and we got to if you love her is the finality of it and so we're like oh shit this is this is happening so we buckled mm -hmm. up and we just kept putting everything down and that was it. Six hours later, whatever it was, we had If You Love Her sitting at, sitting, staring back at us. And it was so real. Everything, even that middle eight section or the bridge. Um, if you really listen, like I'm like, there's a mix of like guitar and strings and me screaming. Like it's mm -hmm. literally the gut wrenching visceral reaction to knowing that everything is gone. The, the, the best way I've ever found to try and describe it is if like, if you had two souls intertwined, that part is where they do this. It's where they break. It's that feeling of like everything coming undone. But nobody would know that about the song mm -hmm. because it, it wasn't, it's not like an anger. It, it's more, Yeah, it doesn't sound like it would be like that type of, yeah, it's you know, like, a, yeah, it's not it's the, the, it's the disintegration <clears throat> pain, the right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I think it's been weird because people have really connected to it and people get very emotional when they hear it for the first time. Like it, it blows my mind. I've had the privilege of watching people on TikTok discover it for the first time and the, the way they ball their eyes out and they're like, why, what's happening here? Why am I like this? I think it's because all those feelings, we somehow lock them into those, those melodies and words and the words themselves are very cute. Like it's, my ex told me um, when we were breaking up, She's like, I don't know if you ever loved me. And I was like, I wrote all these songs about you. She goes, well, maybe you should have spent more time saying them to me. And I was like, oh. Oh, ouch, yeah. <laughs> it killed me. And so when I was writing the lyric, it was more like, you think I don't know you? You really think I didn't get a sense of who you were? Well, here's you. And it was more as a roadmap because it, Nobody gets into anything wanting it to fall apart. Right. Nobody wants things to break. And it was a way of being, it was my way of saying to the world and to her, like, I hope whoever finds her next, just listen to these words because you'll nail it. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought she needed more than she did. I always thought I needed to land a massive smash so I could buy us a big house. Um, I thought she needed that. I thought she needed us to go on fancy trips. I thought she needed certain things. And I guess I wasn't paying attention to, she needed, you know, exactly what I said in the song, like give her a cuddle, give her a kiss, play with her hair when she's sad, tell her she's pretty, just make her feel loved because that would have been enough nuclear love and energy to hold her up while we were trying to figure it out. And the rest are just the moments in between. And that's the beautiful thing of, putting a song like that out into the world because that's really connected. And then the greatest part is then I find myself single, all healed up, put all this work into myself, and not a month and a half later, I meet my now wife. Wow. And it was like the perfect, I was in the perfect place to meet her. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a weird time because I'm living on, just off of Hollywood Boulevard. You know, it's November of 2019, uh, every night I would walk five mile or 5K up and down Hollywood Boulevard. I talked to all the homeless people. I became friends with them all. I knew everybody on Hollywood Boulevard, but I felt like a bit of a monster. I was like, who's gonna love me? You know, I was on like dating apps and 
in LA, it's brutal because someone on a dating app will be like, don't message me unless your credit score is over 800. And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> and I'd never been on a dating you app. You send before. a song. You're like, I wrote this. <laughs> well, at the time, If You Love Her wasn't out yet. I'd just written it. Yeah, but I, <laughs> you had yeah. past hits. Bro, I, was, I don't know, but I still, like, damn. I was like, this, I, like who's going to love? Like, how do I tell somebody, <laughs> hey, um, so right now I'm living between the back of a car and my buddy's couch. Um, how can I, like, I don't have any American credit. I'm Canadian um, mm. and I'm on the suffer bus trying to figure it out, but I have a record deal. Right. Right. It was a trip, man. <laughs> and like so many weird things are happening at this point in time too. Like I had a song of mine landed in a movie. So here I am, I'm broke, but I'm at the Chinese theater off of Hollywood Boulevard watching a movie with my song in it as the, as the backdrop. And I'm like, this is so weird. That's so nevertheless, crazy. I feel like a monster. I feel like, I feel like I got nothing to offer, but my Nana was like, you need to go and put yourself out there, go on some dates. And I was like, well, she said, go be a rock star. And I was like, Nana, I, don't think, <laughs> I think I'm going out to slay here. I'm <laughs> pretty big. Um, but I put myself out there and I was literally going to shut off all the apps I'd given, I was given like a free trial on hinge and it was running out and I was like, I'm, I can't do this. Like, this is not my vibe. And uh, one of the very last people I connected with was my, this girl named Tui. And I was like, oh. And I just sent a message to one thing that she had. And I, you know, she responded. And then, you know, I was like, I don't want to do the bullshit, like sarcastic chit chat, but just uh, let, let's jump on a phone for five minutes, make sure we're real humans, and then figure out a date. And so we do that real quick. And she's That's super awesome. cool. And then, I'm in Hollywood. She was living in, in uh, Marina del Rey. So for like Venice. Yeah. Which, which is a jaunt when you're in LA. Like, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you're like, oh man, that's like three miles, but six hours. Six hours. Yeah. And I'm like, let, me come, <laughs> let, me pick, let me come pick you up and I'll take you on a date. And so she's like, oh, okay. And so I get there and I, I park one. I, I never get nervous for anything. Like I can play to 10,000 people. I, it doesn't really stress me out. Like I get a little bit of excitement, but that's it. But for whatever reason that day, I was tripping, man. I was, I went to a friend's house in Santa Monica like six hours early. I'm like pacing through her apartment with all of her friends. I'm like, what do I do? Where do I go? How do I do this? I haven't, I haven't dated in six years. Like, this is nuts. Yeah. So I find a place and then I, I, I'm like, okay, I can't be late. So I drive to Marina Del Rey. I'm there an hour and a bit early, like a weirdo. And so I park a block away, just hoping she actually, I didn't even think of her like walking by me maybe some uh, me, but I just didn't want to be late. I was, I was so stressed out about it and I'm freaking out and I'm feeling all these weird feelings and like, I don't have a guitar or anything to write. And I, 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 I'm not, I'm not, but I just, I opened my camera and I just started recording myself and I started talking to myself and I was like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm about to meet this person. And I feel crazy because like all these feelings are, are circulating, but I don't know this person. I don't feel like that for anybody. So I'm like, I don't know if like, am I about to meet the one like, what is this? Because I feel like the world's doing this weird shake, like the, like atoms are vibrating weird or something. And sure enough, man, I went on that first date and we spent, like, it felt like a lifetime reconnecting. It felt like I knew her soul a million times over. And there's, I mean, there's a million things to talk about with that. There's a whole bunch of crazy synchronicities that, that make no sense. But, mm -hmm. you know, on that date, I was like, hey, on our uh, 87th date, let's go to Jamaica. She's like, sick, I'm in. And so I pulled out my phone, I made note, one through 87. I put 87, date in Jamaica. And I, why 87? I just picked a random number, thought it was a lot of dates. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thought it'd be a lot of nice dates to hang out with her. Uh, this is the first number I thought of. And uh, yeah, on our 87th date, I asked her to marry me in Jamaica. Holy shit. Oh, and and then, have oh, you I, do you have that I mean to have that video too? I have that you, video, yeah. Do you have you shown it? I'm sure she's seen oh, it yeah, now, yeah. but like how how uh, many dates in were you like, look at this video I made? <laughs> no, I only showed her recently. Oh really? Yeah, because wow. yeah, it was it was creepy, you know? Was yeah, like, but oh, how cool is it though? I didn't know yeah. anything about her. I didn't know any of her story. I didn't know where she came from. I didn't know what if she got in the car and like smelled bad. I don't know. Yeah, but you like, knew it was like you knew and it like like you said, like there was all these synchronicities like you, you had the feel like it's so weird, like you had the feeling and then enough. So where you're like, you flip your camera on, you just start 
talking to it and then you know 87 and then you end up marrying her and like having that like evidence i think is so rad it's it's been pretty rad and then like a year later like we're pandemic is happening sideways mm -hmm. comes out life is crazy if you love her comes out because that, that came out after sideways right i mean yeah. and then because that was that on the next ep single in like september or something like that and it was nuts like i'd never experienced anything like this what kind of took it off was it TikTok? no TikTok, or... wasn't, TikTok wasn't a thing yet oh wow okay it was like all organic all natural like That's no awesome app. i got a sync on love island usa in the finale and that started I don't know if that's what fully kicked it, but it could have, but it got, ended up getting like 40,000 spins a day, Jeez. which then went crazy. Then it hit Amazon music. And then that was up at 400,000 spins a day or close to half a million at times. And then it started to climb all the iTunes charts. It started flying through Apple. And then by Christmas time, it was me, Ed Sheeran and Mariah Carey, one, two, and three. It was nuts. <laughs> like, absolutely. Wow. And That's then so anyway, the next year we go to radio and it starts doing its thing there and starts climbing all the hot AC charts. So it was just, it was just nuts. Cause I'm like, Whoa, you know, when you're writing music all the time, you think every song is great. I really mm. thought something was special about if you love her, but I didn't know. I was like, yeah, it's great. I love all the songs. This one feels special, but right. It but then it, yeah. And the way that it just kind of, it takes off in this way. I mean, that's so crazy. Dude, it started flying and then now and but i can't do anything because because the pandemic's raging so now oh. my hand i can't do any performances i can't get out i can't rep the hit yeah you so, can't really like strike while the iron's hot on that song it's nuts yeah so i'm sitting in pasadena i've got i've got no money we've moved into this like little house in pasadena me and tuli and, and my roommate and we're just hanging walls crazy shit's happening and I'm, I end up doing a songwriting session with this dude named Greg Wattenberg. And we finished the session and, and Greg's like, yeah, what are you doing for the next week? And I'm like, oh, not too much. It was, it was my birthday coming up. And I'm like, what do you got going on? And he goes, oh, I'm working with Rob Thomas. I'm like, oh, say hi to Rob for me. And he's like, you know Rob? I'm like, no, I don't know <laughs> Rob Thomas, man. Like, <laughs> award winning for the song of the year, Super Smash, Santana. Get, no, I don't know yeah. Rob Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's like, oh, he's like, well, like, why'd you say that? I'm like, well, funny story. When I was in high school, the music teacher there knew that I would like mumble and like kind of sing to myself. And they asked me if I'd do a cover of Smooth by Rob Thomas and Carlos Santana. <laughs> and I just agreed to it, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what a cover meant. I didn't know anything about music. And so I get on stage, full courage, but no brain. And I hold the mic and I don't sing a single word. I just start mm, smooth. And so I don't do covers because of this. It like, oh, wow. So deep. So I was like, say hi for me. He's like, well, why don't you hang out with us? And I was like, yeah, it's my birthday. I'll do that. I'll hang out with you. And what a birthday, right? I'll kick it with Rob Thomas. Yeah, why not? And so next thing you know, I'm, I'm on a Zoom with Rob Thomas and Greg. And we start talking. I start telling the story about meeting my wife, about meeting Tuli. She was just my girlfriend at the time. And they, Rob was really enamored with the story and Greg was lo in love with it. And we started writing it out. And it was a couple hour session. And next thing you know, we got Fallen to Me. And that's the second big song I've ever had. Oh my gosh. Wow. So he, he helped. He, yeah. He was like a co write on that with you. Yeah. This is me, Rob, Damn. and Greg. And so, but that's, that's the real story. Like, you know, feeling like a monster. I, there's one line, no mirrors for monsters, no love in sight. And, you know, then watching her walk down the stairs and like, it just, when Tuli walked into my life, like this is her painting behind me. That's what it feels like. Oh like, my gosh. That's such soul, a dope painting. I was wondering who did that. That's her, man. Yeah. She, she just brought color to a whole world of black and white. Love that. Changed my life. And a lot of what I do is inspired by her now. That's amazing. So, so, and yeah. you have a the new ep is that like tell me about this ep that you have coming out and then you're doing like a bunch of shows and tours and like you have so much happening here coming up yeah man so i'm going out on tour with james arthur for the next month starting april 30th doing everything mm -hmm. from san francisco doing the big smiley face all the way back up to the east coast new york playing central park 
which I'm stoked for. I've never done that. Oh, that's awesome. Are you playing and, Nashville? I didn't even see. We are playing Nashville. Yeah, you have to come out. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Marathon yeah. Music Works. Yeah. Hell yeah. You have to come out. We have to be friends in real life. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. Well, uh, and, when we yeah. stop recording, I'm curious. I want to know whereabouts yeah. you are. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not telling anyone in the audience what street I'm on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Or even what's part of town here. Yeah, that's, that's very dangerous. Um, it's not big enough. <laughs> so, yeah, I got that coming, but uh, I have this whole EP undone, which is, I think, like I was trying to say at the beginning of our chat, I'm. Um, I'm try I've always been trying to figure out how to tell my story and it's been really hard. And these love songs are kind of all in the middle of it. It's, it's part of a whole journey, but I've never fully tapped into my life in the way that things happen, you know, the gangs, the, the tough stuff, the rough stuff. And I've had this group of songs that I've been sitting on for years that started to talk about that. And so this is my, segue into that you know so love and loss undone love and loss is the ep it's it's that journey i mean it's it's really stories of love like fine you know i choose you is a song i wrote about my wife she walked down the aisle to it you know it's really crazy. that's cool yeah. these are all real stories none of them are like fabricated they're all like they're the truth you know love somebody again is i love know. that song i think uh, thanks of the ones you've released such the i i've heard the entire ep and it's amazing i i really that one's like in the top of mind right now as far as Dude, i love that but that's i mean that's a real story that's me and my buddy steve solomon again talking about you know walking down hollywood boulevard and like you, i never thought i could love somebody again it's that realization of whoa i, I my heart works yeah you know, long story short is like all the dates tool and i were going on and it just you're when i asked her out i i fumbled through every single word to get there and it <laughs> For a guy who a lot of people consider to be pretty poetic, man, the, the wheels fell off the bus trying to articulate how to ask her out. It literally, they're just like, can I go out with you? It was so bad. Um, you start shifting into the lost side of things, which is, you know, songs like You Were Mine that I just dropped. That's mm -hmm. a friend of mine passed away and that's oh, her story. And so the music video is her, her story, you know, and like working alongside with her parents to tell the story properly. And. Wow, that get, must have been hard. I mean, to so you, yeah, went to kind of get the the okay for to write the song in a way, I guess. It was well, the music video more so. The song, okay, is thing because you know it, anyone can hear it, but the music video is is pretty on point for the most part. Of so, it was my friend Lissy, she passed away. Um, yeah, it was just a tragedy. Her and her sister share a condition that they're the only two people in the world with it, and they they don't know what it is, and oh so God. they never thought, yeah. Anyway, she passed very, very quickly, and it was it was it was quite a shock. But I've honored them. When Lissy passed, her mom asked me two things in particular. One was not to forget their family because you know we're very bonded, and just because Lissy's not there, that we're all still here, and we can honor that. And the other thing was to write a song for her. And so I tried for like a year to a year, maybe a year and a half, to write the song, and finally this one felt like it was it was meant to honor her and. It does a thing and the music video is out there to reflect that. And this is the other side of loss. And so then the next couple songs that people are gonna hear on the EP, it's like one, I lost a friend, a friend, you know, you get vulnerable to a friend and they, they treat you like a like like shit. And you're like, you know, it's that classic turn the other cheek. So I wrote a song called I Wish You Well, which is like two of these to be like, I wish you well. Go figure your shit out. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It's like here in the South, they say, bless your heart. Bless your heart. That's why <laughs> I, I wish you well. Yeah. And then that, that, that bleeds into where I want to be, which is a, a mixture of love and loss and then undone, which is, you know, the track, the t title track off the EP, which is the moment I'm standing in the doorway, talking to my ex going, I know that you found somebody and you're lying about it. And what that moment felt like when you like ripped my heart out of my chest and didn't care about me. And so it's, it's just a very honest song, but I think I'm curious to hear what the world thinks of it. I'm curious to hear how my fans react to it. Cause it's, it's real. It's part of an emotion, but it also sets the stage for what's coming next. Awesome. Man. Well, I, I think what you're doing is obviously incredible. I, I love the EP and 
on Thursday, the world will will hear it, <laughs> which is awesome, or Friday, whatever it may be. Thursday at, Thursday at midnight. Thursday at 9 p.m. if you're in the, the West Coast. <laughs> we always got away with, uh, when I was on the radio in San Diego, my program director, he never followed the rules of the labels, or if they wanted us to play a certain song, we'd get like season assist because he would just play another song on the record that he'd like more. Um, but he, he would call me at 9 and send me the song. He's like, this comes out at midnight. Play it at nine. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Beat everyone to the punch. Yeah, he'd always do that shit. It was so funny. But um <laughs> Love that. Well, well, dude, I yeah, I'm gonna May 10th. You're in. I just I looked at the day, it's a Friday. So yeah, you're coming, that, man. We got hell it. yeah, I'm so excited. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, yeah. before I turn the recording off and ask you another question. Yeah. I want to know <laughs> uh if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Yeah, as cliche as it sounds, don't stop. You know, well, two things. You have to be realistic. So, and, and what I mean by that is when you put stuff out, you need to understand what you're getting back as far as, I call it the echo. The world's going to tell you if your stuff is good enough. Mm -hmm. you, don't need, you don't need anybody else. Your friends are going to be there to hype you. As someone uh, wiser than me once told me when I was first starting out, fill a room with people who don't give a shit about you. It'll change your life. Make it about, let, let the world show up for you. If you're good enough, they will. And if they're not showing up, it doesn't mean you have to give up. Just try and figure out and understand why they're not showing up. The thing is, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel of, of being an artist. And, and it, but it's also understanding what part of an artist you are. Are you in the music business or are you a hobbyist? Both are fine. Do you like to play music for yourself? Do you like the feeling of making songs and putting them out in the world and having them connect with people? Do that. That's great. You don't have to have any expectation back. If you're trying to buy a house off of making a song, you have to look at it differently. So it's no different than anything else in the world. If you open a coffee shop and you're in the middle of nowhere where no one's going to come into your coffee shop, you're probably not going to sell coffee. If you're making music for people who aren't around to hear it and they don't like it, you're making the wrong thing. So know your fan base, know the point of what you're trying to make, and be wildly committed to it. It took me a forever to get there. I mean, and if anything, people, if they listen to this whole thing, you're going to learn that I've been homeless multiple times during this. You're going to learn that I failed a bunch of times. The only thing that separated me from any of the people around me who are also doing this, who aren't where I am today, is that I just didn't stop. That's the big difference. So don't stop, but also know what it is you're doing. Because if it's not working, you have to figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, then maybe you need to take a different direction to use that energy towards. So maybe that gives someone the insight they're looking for, but that's that's worked for me. I don't know if it'll work for everybody else, but. Bring me the best word, yeah.